Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Danahart, and I would like to tell you how to create a butterfly haven. Um, I'm going to talk about habitat restoration uh, because I think that habitat restoration is one of those tools in the conservationist toolbox which isn't really um, used as frequently as it should be. And I think in part in the UK that's happened because early phytosociologists classified a range of semi-natural habitats and conservationists got kind of caught up with always trying to reproduce or to preserve and conserve those types of habitats. So the idea about creating surrogate habitats, which is what my work is about, was probably quite an alien concept to them. And in the UK, we really do need to start thinking about this now because uh, I would describe our landscape almost as an industrialised landscape because our agriculture is so intensive. We use an awful lot of uh, pesticides. Our habitats are fragmented. It makes it very difficult for organisms to move around in a meta population dynamic way. So landscape approaches to conservation management are very, very difficult uh, unless you start putting some of that habitat back. So I first got uh, into this idea when I read this paper in the Journal of Environmental Management in 1994 by Morris et al, which looked at an ecological engineering approach to this uh, problem. Uh, they looked at uh, an anthill and realized that microclimate could be manipulated by the topography of the anthill. And you can see here a graph looking at uh, uh, temperature profiles, which uh, mimic the, the uh, profiles of the topography of the anthills. So they suggested this could be applied by removing the topsoil from chalk, and they were working on chalk. Uh, and I, I should say, by the way, they never did this. They wrote this up because they felt it was a good idea, and I'm really pleased they did, because obviously I've applied this to my own location, because I live on chalk, and I live in a city of 270,000 people. We all live on chalk, and uh, so therefore the, the application for this in our city is, is profound. It's, it's quite a real opportunity to do this. So they removed the topsoil, they dug down about a metre, they took that spoil and put it on top, and so they could create a slope there of about two metres deep. Um, and then the, I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do that when I was doing my PhD. The university uh, bureaucrats wouldn't allow me to dig up the campus. So I waited to become a school teacher. The headmaster then had to be convinced. And when we went for a BBC uh, Breathing Places lottery funded award uh, of £10,000, uh, he was uh, more than happy to, to agree to doing that. So this is the site that we had in mind. Uh, this is the Surrenden campus, it's 28 hectares. We've got six educational institutions on it. And this is the little area here that we had in mind. It's about half the size of a football pitch. Um, and you can see here that we have uh, some linear uh, uh, banks that we had in mind of, to produce. Uh, this is south facing, this is east facing. Um, and uh, first thing we did was to record the wildflowers that we had in that area. Now look, I must tell you, by the way, that I knew that uh, when schools were told that they would apply, could apply for this £10,000, many would be going for uh, planting up woodlands or creating ponds, but I didn't think many of them would be uh, applying for money to topographically modify chalk grass and to manipulate microclimate at ground level for early successional chalk grass and butterflies. So, I mean, I must say I was delighted that as a consequence we got that £10,000. So, 10 wildflower species in that half football size area. And that's what it looked like. That was the day before we started work with the plant machinery. And what we first of all did was to remove the topsoil uh, and then we mixed the subsoil and the chalk bedrock together to create our banks. And there's a first bank, it's south facing, quite large on the left, and there's a spoil down the bottom on the right. The spoil was compacted, that's the top left hand corner. And then you can see in the bottom right hand corner, well let me just show you a larger picture of that, we had three banks. So this is the south facing ones in front and the east facing uh, at the end there in the top right hand corner. So we had a large bank, a middle sized bank and a, a small bank of about a meter wide. And we did that because we were not sure about how uh, size might uh, uh, affect the work that we were trying to do. Now I started working with John Gapper here and John has worked for Brighton Hove City Councils for 45 years. And he noticed maybe 40 years ago that wildflowers were beginning to diminish in abundance and numbers around the city and started to collect wildflower seed and has grown them every year because he hasn't got any special equipment to be able to keep that seed. He grows them every year and has done for 40 years. So John supplied a lot of wildflower plugs for us. Uh, here on the bottom left hand corner there it is in its compost. Uh, he removes the compost and on the bottom right hand side you see the bare roots. That means we don't introduce 
very much uh, alien material to the site. It also means that the roots then have to really push out quickly to get into the, the chalk um, uh, soil in order to be able to survive. And that created like a 95% success rate. So here we have got 70, uh, 1,700 children all being part of this process. And I think that's very important for children to realize that they can make a difference when it comes to uh, issues about like biodiversity loss. Uh, and this is what John Gapper gave us, 5,515 wildflower plugs. And you can tell that John uh, you know, didn't give a, a great variety of things, but crucially important things that we needed for this work. Uh, we uh, uh, planted them, and they obviously successfully uh, uh, started to grow his sorrel, which is the host plant of the um, small copper, uh, strawberry, the host plant of the grizzled skipper butterfly. Uh, the, down the bottom, we have uh, 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 vetch, the host plant of the, um, uh, the chalk hill blue and the Adonis blue, and then the, the toe flax, which is uh, the toe flax brocade uh, uh, host plant. So, you know, obviously, all of these things are doing very well. We also decided to sow. Uh, the, the land with a proprietary seed mix. This is not local provenance like John's stuff. I mean, John's stuff is all uh, local genetic stock, which is very, very valuable and important, I think, in these projects. But we're, we're, we're sowing here a proprietary seed mix, which was quite a diverse seed mix. Uh, and it was an Emmorsgate EM6 uh, uh, seed mix with chalk and limestone soils. Um, and then the next day, that's what we got. I mean, this was really lucky. You can't order this online, I'm afraid. But this, this, the snow kept the seed in place. Uh, it gave it um, a, a cold treatment, so stratification took place. And as it melted, it helped with uh, release water so germination could take place. And we had quite good results. So this is that mix. And I'd just like to point out that kidney vetch was only 1.5% of the whole seed mix there. This is one year after sowing. Now, even I look at that and think, you know, from a distance, it doesn't look particularly good. But let's have a look a little bit more closely than that. Here you can see bare soil, uh, uh, patch of green, bare soil, patch of green. That's because we sowed it like that. We sowed areas that would be uh, uh, dominated by the seed mix and others where there was no seed mix at all. And that's, we wanted to be leaving bare patches for our thermal regulatory butterflies if they were to come along. And also we wanted to see how successful that seed mix was. And remember that 1.5% uh, kidney vegetable lot there it is, it's growing, it's almost like 70% of the cover there. So that's great because that's a host plant of one of our target species, Cupido minimus, the small blue. Now look, as I said, which salad would you like on your plate? And on the left is what we got in terms of diverse sward from that mix, and uh, on the right is what we started off with in the minimisable grassland. I, I know what I would rather have, it, it's really clear to me. Uh, by September 2008, we were certainly, uh, people could see some of the wildflowers blooming, um, <clears throat> but don't take my word for it. Look, have a look at what these professionals uh, told us. Liz Williams, uh, the late Liz Williams, who we ended up naming this Butterfly Haven afterwards, uh, did a survey for us along with Peter Hodge in 2008. And that's what Liz found in the wildflowers. Now remember, we planted wildflower plugs, we put in some seed mix, we've disturbed the seed bank. And also there's opportunistic species coming in from outside. An order of magnitude increase in wildflowers. An order of magnitude. I really want to underscore this. We're talking initially about raising awareness of biodiversity loss. We end up replacing biodiversity, increasing biodiversity. That's the difference. And this is what's so fundamentally important. 1,700 children know that they can make a difference. John uh, has, uh, Peter Hodgerabra has found for us, uh, you know, look, nationally scarce insects, uh, which are not, you know, not butterflies, uh, nationally scarce uh, in a British context, uh, red data book species, uh, toad, flux, uh, toad flax brocade came in rare, its own biodiversity action plan. So clearly we can make a real impact. And these are all the obscure little invertebrates that most people uh, are not particularly interested in. John told me that pitcher wing fly was a new colonist from continental Europe. We see a lot of this uh, where we are because of recent climate change, lots of things moving forward. We were the first location to find that in the UK. Uh, but these are the cogs within which, you know, uh, uh, ecosystems, by which ecosystems function. And people need to know about it. And so this is a slow educational process. But of course, you know, even butterflies aren't, particularly appealing to everybody. As soon as we had sheep on our site to manage it, people came running for, for miles to see the sheep. I, I don't understand it. And then, anyway, there are the butterflies. That's the first year. We had the common blue and the meadow brown, both those two species, uh, probably the most uh, popular, uh, abundant species in the UK. 
And then the at the bottom, the Yeti skipper and the uh, small copper. Really pleasing to see those species in uh, the site in the first year. Now, like I said, we, we had grazing. These sheep came in from the Sussex Wildlife Trust. We have a relationship, a partnership with these, these guys. And uh, the sheep come in, they, they really hammer the grasses so that the wildflowers have a chance to grow. They keep the nutrients low so that uh, there is no competitive edge between one species. So vitally important. Uh, and then that's what it looks like. Now, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm probably speaking to an audience who are really uh, quite frequently working with tropical biodiversity. And to them, this must look like a green desert. You know, from my point of view, from a northern uh, hemisphere point of view, this looks really good habitat for Lysini butterflies, which are uh, restricted to chalk and limestone uh, soils. Uh, in the summer 2009, I know there's still a lot of wildflowers in there and it's quite dense and we need to have a little bit more space and uh, uh, reduce that density, but we are getting new species like the brown argus and the hedge brown come in. Now this bottom left hand corner is of the face that you make when you discover or you've been told that you've got a nationally rare butterfly colonising your uh, butterfly uh, haven. This was a target species, as I said, the small blue, uh, and here it was laying eggs. Now, do you know, uh, you think about this, the nearest colony is three kilometers for us. This is a tiny, tiny butterfly, uh, and it's got wings and it's got antennae. So the antennae are obviously olfactory uh, organs. The plants are throwing out lots of secondary metabolic, secondary metabolic uh, compounds uh, into the atmosphere and, and they can they can target in on this. So, you know, in the early 70s, uh, Jeremy Thomas was, was finding in his small colonies of Adonis blue that they weren't uh, dispersing enough. And I think that's because the populations weren't very healthy and density dependent factors like um, males hitting on females which have already been mated, causing them to move off. Those sort of things weren't happening in small populations. Whereas our populations have become more healthy over the years and we've got our conservation management right, so species have begun to move throughout the landscape as they should do. So these organisms are designed to travel through the landscape and that's why we've got them at our site. And of course creating sites like this is, is uh, massive in terms of our understanding about the ecology of these organisms because we now know that they can come to us. This is summer 2010 and it's looking quite uh, 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 like a pictorial meadow in, in many ways. Here is a, the uh, internationally famous uh, late uh, Professor Bellamy coming to uh, view the site. Uh, and uh, the news got even better because the small blue colonised the site. We certainly, uh, we certainly had a colony the very next year uh, establish itself. Uh, there is the uh, green hair streak and John Gapper is having a look at that. So we're really pleased to see that um, uh, uh, overpositing on the site, but I, I should say that 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 was a one-off, and uh, you know that was quite interesting. That this is, everything that you see, you you learn something from. Uh, we had uh, singletons of the uh, chalky blue come in, but perhaps most profound for me was that the uh, Adonis blue, which was a, a butterfly that we thought we would lose in the 70s in the UK, we thought that it would go extinct. Here it is coming to us. Those, that very same species that Jeremy Thomas didn't think travelled very far, three kilometres away is the nearest site for that as well, uh, and there is a, a copulating couple on the site. So clearly getting the habitat right, but I would say partially right, is, is of real benefit. The next step was you know, introducing other things. Now this is yellow rattle, the bottom right hand corner, it's a, a wildflower which is parasitic on grasses, it helps uh, uh, reduce their strength and adds to the floral diversity of the, the site, but I was given permission to go to a National Nature Reserve. In the UK, we have National Nature Reserves, probably the, the best form of biodiversity legislation because that's where all of our natural heritage has been kept and looked after. That's where we, I hope that it will all be di disseminated from as we begin to do more and more habitat restoration within our country. If you look, if you use a sweetener, you don't just get wildflower seed. You get a whole host of invertebrates, including things like mollusks, which would really have a hard time dispersing to new sites. So using this technique, not only can we introduce new wildflowers, but we can also introduce a whole new biota of invertebrates. And those, therefore, you know, making the diversity of this surrogate habitat even greater. The small blue population, clearly established by 2011, uh, you know, immensely uh, uh, pleasing to see that. Uh, and then by this stage, we then get to the 21st species, 21 species, and, and, I, and I include this because this particular individual was sighted three weeks earlier than any other butterfly uh, of that species within the UK on our site. Again, another little anecdotal bit of information to show us that climate change was beginning to have a, 
uh, an impact at this point. Now, our site was getting quite uh, overwhelmed with uh, some rank grasses, and I thought, well, maybe we should open it up, get back to some chalk, allow some thermal regulation of the butterflies we had. So I got a bulldozer in to do that, and lo and behold, I realised, if you look at that picture on the right-hand side, that, in fact, far more of our banks was soil than chalk, and, and I didn't realise that. The, obviously, the contractors who'd done that work hadn't quite done the work how I'd expected. So um, <clears throat> this started making me think. Uh, because, like you know, getting the conditions right is, is really important. Going back to the green hair streak, they were laying eggs, but they never formed a population on that site. And I think it's because the sward was too dense and not enough room for these butterflies to firm regulate. You must understand that where we are at the north, they're at the very limits of their their continental distributions, and, and they can't they can't go through their life cycles if the temperatures aren't just right. Now, this is an indication as to what could be right. This is a chalk cutting on a highway near to where I live, and it's so steep, the gradient is so steep, that soils can't form on it. And uh, butterflies like the Adonis blue, there's a caterpillar of the Adonis blue, with a symbiotic relationship with cement there, it has existed and come in there uh, by chance and has and been on that site for a very long time. So this gives us indications about what we should be doing with regards to making our uh, new sites. So thinking about all of this, uh, in conjunction, we'd noticed that on our linear sites, the north, north and south facing slopes were not nearly as diverse for invertebrates or wildflowers as our uh, east to west facing slopes. So linear was out and curvy linear was in, increasing uh, aspects, multiple aspects, increasing uh, microclimatic conditions in terms of their diversity, and also uh, increasing the range of ecological, ecological niches. And look, that's pure chalk, no longer any soil in it. Uh, so we got the children to uh, plant some wildflower seeds, so put a very few number of wildflower plugs, and look, within five years, it doesn't look much difference, but in five years, we get this species, the small blue inhabiting that site. So we've moved away from trying to impress the public by something that looks beautiful, to trying to impress butterflies, to produce something which is long-lasting. I think this site could probably be a contribution to local nature conservation for up to 25 years. Um, and, and that's very, very valuable. But it also makes us realise that because we're working with uh, early successional organisms, we need to continuously recreate these habitats throughout and have this uh, age range of different sites so that we have a, um, a metapopulation dynamics working throughout the landscape. Back of the Liz Williams butterfly haven, you can now see that the small blue colonies are the most persistent and the most abundant within Sussex. Now this obviously gets some interest from the national press. Uh, Patrick Barkham did us a, an article in the Guardian newspaper, which is very helpful because of course if people recognise what we're doing, the word spreads and it makes people interested in what we're trying to achieve. We got interested in geoglyphs because of course we're working with a high contrast uh, substrate. Chalk is white and on uh, a green background you could make things. And We live in an era where there's satellites going all over, the, uh, all over the place all the time. So we could advertise what we're doing from the air and this was very much in my mind. And I started talking to a range of different organisations and in individuals trying to influence with regards to how we could start to get people to do this. So this is uh, a series of butterfly havens that were created by the Parks Department in Brighton Hove. I, I had consultation with them, I advised them about how they should do this, I worked with the planning department as well, and the, you can see they're using these curvilinear structures now, uh, and they're trying to make a, a, an impact from, uh, from above so that they can be seen um, from Google Earth. And also, you know, I've advised on a one million pound project called the Brilliant Butterflies Project, which is run, which was a, a bid by the Natural History Museum, the uh, London Wildlife Trust, and the national charity Butterfly Conservation. And that project now in South London is doing very, very well as well. In in Brighton and Hove, we now have thirty of these butterfly havens, and that's one of them. So. The idea here is we've got a desire line, that's the, the major path through which people naturally walk, that's the path through the middle. We've got these two little spots on the outside, and if you, would, you can go into those spots, you can observe the, the area, you have picnics in the area, but what you can't see from this, this sort of angle is that there are all kinds of banks in there. So I was really pleased to see that they were taking this stuff on board. We also were saying, like, you know, in chalk, in chalk alone, not chalk soil, but in chalk, you can grow a lot of uh, wildflowers, particularly, you know, designed to live in this type of environment, uh, and it reduces the likelihood that, that grasses will grow. So this really is, chalk dust is biodiversity uh, gold dust. And this was a demonstration here at a festival of nature, trying to get people to realise that we live on a real resource here. 
So I was able to nominate Brighton Hove City Council uh, for the work they'd done producing those 30 butterfly havens and the Christian Marshall Award was given to them, which delighted me. Here's John Gapper and his son Mark Gapper collecting that and you can see me here with my comedy moustache. It was a delightful day to see that happen. Uh, but the next thing was, was that I began to start working with my own school, I, I've now retired, uh, only about five days retired, but I worked with the school because our school started off as a 600 children going to that school, but by the time I left, or during the time I left, there was up to 1,700 children. So our um, physical education resources, the football pitches, were worn to pieces. They were bas basically lots of dust. So we had to get in a, an artificial football pitch, you know, made of you know, uh, synthetic materials, because it was durable. This led to the opportunity of a, a great deal of mitigation for, um, for biodiversity work. So here's the, 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 the geoglyphs, bringing those into play. Uh, locally, we have the Long Man of Wilmington, that's this site here. Uh, we have the White Horse of uh, High and Over. These have strong cultural resonances for the people that live locally. So we've got the children in the different schools and the Surrenden campus to design different things, and we kind of work these out into uh, designs that we would put onto our campus. And so here we are, this is the campus again, and you can see these different uh, different uh, geoglyphs uh, put in place. These, this is just a graphic of it. You know, fashion changes, economics never do. We, we run out of money, we never were able to do that. This is the original, number five here is the, the Liz Williams Butterfly Haven. We did do some types of uh, Butterfly Haven work with these different schools, but we were not able to produce these geoglyphs. But I include them here, just like Mike Morris and his colleagues included the concept of ecological engineering in that paper. They couldn't do it, I couldn't do it, but it brings knowledge into the popular uh, domain so that people can think about doing it in the future. Um, however, I was able to argue the case for this. This is at the end of the football pitch, and the contractors were desperate to put perennial ryegrass on this. And I really argued, no, no, you shouldn't. So we got the kids to uh, sow wildflowers uh, that were host plants for the butterflies, and between uh, within 18 months of this being planted, we had the Adonis Blue and the uh, Small Blue, both with their own biodiversity action plans, both legally protected, on this site. Now, hardly anybody ever goes there, just a few butterfly enthusiasts, <clears throat> but that's not the point. There's loads of land like this where people hardly ever go, but they could make real differences for um, habitat, uh, sorry, uh, um, metapopulation dynamics within landscape networks for uh, rare and endangered organisms. And it's getting this joined up thinking right, which is really important. Because my view is, is that, you know, I can't change the world, but I can help influence how we manipulate our small part of the world with the sure and certain knowledge that over other parts of the globe, other people will be doing the same thing. Telling children and, in, and, and enabling them to be participating in things like this is essential, I think, because it allows them to, to, to have knowledge that they can make a difference. And in this world where we're forever telling them how gloomy everything is, this gives them the real chance to actually produce a, a real difference and be a part of that process. And so here we are working with our neighbouring schools now. Each school was making their own little butterfly haven, not necessarily as a geoglyph. <clears throat> but we were creating things, and it was lovely to, for the small children to be involved in that process. Now, our original Liz Williams Butterfly Haven had the benefit of a real makeover. You can see that it looks very di different there. You know, we have parentheses and, and crosses and all kinds of strange shapes, and I'd love to think uh, what uh, archaeologists might think was going on here maybe a thousand years in the future, if it still exists. Um, but it was fantastic for us, and we were really trying to apply the knowledge that we'd gained from the work we'd done previously. And, you know, in the first uh, year after that, 2016, obviously a lot of stuff in the seed bank for, that we'd seen before. But once we started managing it, you can see here, this is the winter, we started cutting it all back. This is really beginning to look good. We're using brush cutters in this case because it allows us to be a lot more surgical than just using sheep. Uh, but, you know, I'm really beginning to, from my, my eye is telling me this is looking like good habitat. We also started to work with the Millennium Seed Bank, the, the um, Native Seed Hub, which is based at Wakehurst, it's part of Kew, because these guys go around collecting wildflower seed of local provenance, which is always important to us, and uh, they uh, are able to store it in the, their Millennium Seed Bank, which, you know, they've got millions of seeds from all over the world, but what do you do with it once it's there? How do you use it? We're a great partner for them to be able to demonstrate how that might be possible. So we did a literature search of the nectar and host plant sources of the butterflies we expected to find in our region. And we asked the Millennium Seed Bank to make us a butterfly-specific seed mix. Not a seed mix 
which was to create a particular type of habitat, but a seed mix for supporting invertebrate communities, a surrogate uh, habitat. And this is the mix that we asked them to do, to produce for us. And then something rather neat, I thought, was because we were forever trying to manipulate the height of sward, we simply separated that mix into the tall and the short, and then sowed it next to one another, so that some would grow tall, some would grow short, and you know, the invertebrates can still move in between that, but we were deliberately manipulating, but it was something that wouldn't happen in nature. We are being artificial about this, but seeing what we could do. Um, so we worked with, this is my, my friend Stuart West, he came down to prepare the, the ground below. We did that, the media came in, CNN were interested, uh, BBC are always interested in what we're doing, and again, this really helps us with our work, because it, uh, if, if the, the, the thing about media is if, if people, if the media are interested, then, then other people seem to think it's important. And if other people think it's important, then they give you permission to do things. Uh, in the past, I've been probably guilty of um, doing things without permission and then apologising because it's easier. But this way around, it, it definitely helps. And there we are. Suddenly, we have the Adonis blueback, we have the Chalk Hill blueback. These are not just vagrants coming in. These are now established populations. We're really beginning to get this habitat right. And these are the 29th and 30th species, the, the dingy skipper and the dark green fertility. Um, it's amazing because uh, we now have 81% of all the species of butterfly found in our city uh, on this half-sized football pitch. You know, it just goes to show what you can do if you get things right. And that's what it looks like in the summer of 2020. You know, it's looking good. There are patches that, which are really good for butterflies and also a whole host of other invertebrates. Now, what can you do? This is outside my house. I began to think, what can we do elsewhere? Outside the front of my house, I've got a bit of uh, lawn, um, and I made an arrangement with the local council asking them for permission for me to personally manage it. So we cut it, we planted, this is my friend here, we planted 4,000 wildflower plugs. I then mowed a, uh, a managed margin around the edge. The English have got this obsession with mowing lawns really, really short. I think it's all about a controllable thing. But if you manage uh, have a managed margin around the edge, it shows people that the tall stuff in the middle is deliberate uh, and is not neglected. I also uh, did a cross in it so people could walk through it and not damage the wild flowers. And look, you can see I'm delighted in the bottom right hand corner that some runners ran through that almost immediately afterwards. Uh, and then after the first year, we mowed it, removed that vegetation to reduce the nutrient content on it. We've done that year after year. The amount of vegetation we removed has diminished year after year. And this is it, 2017, 2020. You know, I'm absolutely delighted by this. I go out and I spend time and I look at it and I, I absolutely love it. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you're interested in uh, something completely different, please go to corefoodbutterflyconservation.org. Um, uh, and uh, thank you.